This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Together again, you, us, the amazing world of agriculture. This is the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Hate to sound like a broken record, but once again, we got a great show for you. Coming up, the Monitor was there as the Southern Peanut Growers Conference celebrated two decades of existence. What's been the key to its success and why one official thinks it will only get better with time? Also on the program, it's off to Brunswick, Georgia for a hands-on shrimping experience that puts you, the average Joe, on a boat with real shrimpers. And then later, step into a world where art and horticulture come together. It's Atlanta location, the only one of its kind in the U.S. These stories and so much more are starting right now on the Farm Monitor. And we begin in Jekyll Island, where recently Georgia Farm Bureau hosted its annual Young Farmers and Ranchers Leadership Conference. The yearly gathering offering attendees the opportunity to learn from and network with their peers while enjoying time away from their farms. John Holcomb made the trip and has the story. There was plenty of food, fun, and fellowship this year on Jekyll Island as the Georgia Farm Bureau put on its annual Young Farmers and Ranchers Conference. It's a chance to shine the spotlight on an organization that is essential to the future of the agriculture industry. The importance of having this conference is really just about fellowship and networking with other young farmers throughout the state. Gives a chance everybody to get away from their farms, learn from each other, uh, and just enjoy some learning and relaxation. Just like every year, they had a theme. This year, that theme was gaining ground. Gaining ground for agriculture at the local, state, and even the national level. You know, our, our voice needs to be heard on, on our thoughts and the way things, you know, should be run in the future because we are the future. So that was that was the main reason behind the, the gaining grounds because, you know, everything we do, we feel like we need to be moving one step closer and one step farther. And to help start that ground gaining, change. That change started with the conference as the committee worked to make it as engaging and family friendly as possible. We've added a lot of educational workshops. We have 12 different workshops for different areas, business, um, education, policy, and advocacy. Reporting in Jekyll for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Meantime, a highlight of the annual convention is the variety of speakers those in attendance get to hear from. One of the speakers this year was Michelle Miller, an advocate for agriculture and very popular on social media. In fact, she currently has more than 90,000 followers. Here now, in her own words, Michelle Miller. Hi, my name is Michelle Miller. I also go as the farm babe on social media, do public speaking, um, an agricultural columnist, and do a lot of social media outreach to help consumers understand how their food is produced from more of a science-based perspective. So I guess a little bit about my background, uh, why I'm so passionate about this topic is because I grew up in farming. I was a Wisconsin 4-H kid, always rode horses, and was really interested in agriculture. But Moved to Los Angeles for college, lived in LA and Chicago, and was a big city girl who ultimately fell victim to a lot of the myths out there about agriculture. Um, there's so much misinformation, whether that's food labeling from different companies or different movies, activist groups, and it can be really easy to um, not really understand how to decipher fact from fiction online. Uh, so a few years ago, I guess about five, six years ago now, I um, met and started dating a farmer, moved to Iowa for him, and realized that everything I thought I knew about agriculture was wrong. <laughs> so to go from the big city girl that fell victim to every myth to learning the real truth, uh, you know, your eyes are really open. So I started my blog, The Farm Babe. Uh, Thefarmbabe.com is my website or you can search Farm Babe on social media, and uh, I'm a columnist on agdaily.com. So through all those different channels, um, you know, you've, you've found a, a number of different ways to share the voice of, of agriculture and help people not fear their food and really get the truth out there about the industry. I started my Facebook page about three and a half years ago, and between that and Instagram and, you know, Twitter and all that stuff, I have about 90,000 followers now. So it's been a great platform to be able to reach consumers on all different levels, whichever is anybody's favorite to get their information from. But 
Social media is definitely the number one place to get their information nowadays, so it's great to have access to all those different platforms to help share our stories. And speaking of stories, plenty of those in Miramar Beach, Florida recently as the Southern Peanut Growers Conference celebrated 20 years. The monitor was there as more than 475 peanut growers and industry professionals gathered at the Sandestin Golf and Beach Resort. Opportunities and change, that was the theme of this year's conference. And of course, Georgia Peanut Commission Executive Director Don Kaler has been there for every single one of them. We've seen the crowds get bigger as we've gone along and then uh, sponsorships have grown because the industry wanted to be a part of it, all the supply chain in the industry. Uh, we have a lot better support from, uh, you know, from the users of our product because they send out, send all the snacks for the refreshment breaks and all. So, and, and show up. The top buyer for Mars is here at our conference right now. So, it does give us an opportunity, but it's all targeted toward issues that are important to farmers. Now what we find is folks working together, even in this farm bill that we're in, for Kraft Foods to be calling us up and saying, wait a minute, we want to know what we can do to help. Uh, um, it sure makes uh, for a, a good working relationship when that happens. So good news there for the peanut industry, but this here, not so good news for blueberry growers in Georgia. Renee Allen, a UGA extension agent for commercial blueberry production, reports that an early spring freeze cost Georgia blueberry farmers as much as 60% of their crop this season. According to Allen, there was sporadic loss across the blueberry farms in the southeastern part of the state, losses that were determined by the temperature lows, the cold air, and where it settled. When we come back, the important information shared at the Sunbelt Expo field day, including the reason why some farmers are having to resort to airplanes in lieu of traditional sprayers. I love agriculture. I love the industry. I firmly believe that any person can find their role and their passion in FFA, and I guarantee that and it, every life will be changed when they put on the corduroy jacket. And that's a big message behind the reason why I'm serving as the North Region State Vice President. And I want to give the same experience to others that I've had in FFA. To learn more about the National FFA Organization, log on to FFA.org. Hi, I'm Paul Puglis with the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension. Today I want to share with you some ways that you can take advantage of the services that we have through your local county extension office as far as troubleshooting problems in your landscape. There are a lot of things that you can submit to us through digital pictures and images uh, over the internet, either through email or uh, by texting to your local county extension office. You can take pictures of weeds that you need identified in your landscape, insects that you might find in your garden, and even disease samples of plants that are having problems that are sick with diseases such as viruses or fungi or other problems. So when you take a sample, it's very important that you take a good sample and make sure that you're actually taking it in a way that you can photograph it with a background that's usually white or neutral so that you can get a good image. Um, the best types of samples are big samples. The bigger you can get it, the better, especially with flowers. Flowers are one of the most important identifying features for being able to identify weeds. Uh, for grasses, if you're looking at grasses, the seed head on that grass is very important as far as identification as well. With disease samples, you want to make a good sample that has a range of symptoms that are both healthy and diseased on the same branch. And that'll make it easier to help identify if it is a disease or if it's something that's spreading and whether or not you need to do something about it. So when you're taking your pictures, make sure that you uh, have a camera with a wide angle. Uh, it can be a digital camera or even a phone or iPad. Uh, the technology we have today works very, very well. And so you want to zoom in like this. And of course, you know there's a zoom feature here where you can, you can get really close. And I would suggest taking two or three different images, maybe some close-ups of the seed heads or the flower. Um, and again, with that white background, it really makes it stand out. Make sure you get it in focus and take several images that you can email. With, picture, with uh, insects, uh, it's a lot easier to film insects or take pictures of insects when they're already dead. Uh, so the best way to take a dead picture or a picture of a dead insect um, is to take some alcohol, 
put it in a jar and sedate that insect before you take a picture of it and then lay it out and dry it. And then you can get a nice close-up picture of that insect um, in, your, in your view here. And then uh, for disease samples, again, you want to get sort of the whole branch. I would suggest getting a, a picture of the whole branch and then maybe some close-up pictures as well of the symptoms that you're seeing. One other thing that can be helpful for, tr for troubleshooting uh, problems in the landscape is a landscape shot. So if you could, sometimes it's better to get a picture of the, of the whole tree um, and what's going on in the landscape behind it. Because a lot of problems have to do with the environment. Maybe too much water, poor drainage, too much sun, too much shade. And so send me a landscape shot as well as the close-ups that you're seeing of the disease or the insect that you're having problems with. And again, this is a quick and easy way to get uh, information and troubleshooting through your co local county extension office. Some information you want to submit with that is the name of the plant that you found it on, how big the problem is, is it affecting multiple plants in the landscape, how long have you been seeing it, and how many plants are actually affected. Those are some basic things you need to include in that email or that text that you send to your local county extension office. And the great thing about this is we can return a phone call usually the very next day a lot quicker than you bringing us a sample um, or you know, having to uh, schedule a site visit uh, to come out and see you in, in your landscape. So for more information, contact your local county extension office, and you can also go to our local website at ugaextension.org, look up your local county extension office and get their contact information to submit samples by email. And also you can continue to follow us on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Farmers from around the state recently toured the more than 600-acre Darrell Williams Research Farm in Moultrie as part of the annual Sunbelt Expo Field Day. Not only did they get an update on the latest research around the industry, they also got advice on the cotton and peanut crops. Damon Jones was there and has the story. Weed control, insecticides, and variety trials were some of the topics discussed at this year's Sunbelt Expo Field Day held out in Moultrie. However, the most important issue might have been the weather as heavy rains during the planting season put a slight damper on the peanut crop. Now May is what, what hurt us. May, we had a lot of people that started getting into the fields when they really would plant a majority of their crop, and then it started raining. And when it started raining, it didn't quit for three weeks. And we've got people that usually are through planting by May 15th, you know, between May 1st and May 15th. They didn't start planting until June. With the crop being put in the field later than normal, peanuts are obviously a little behind schedule. We are a tad bit behind on pod growth right now, uh, probably a week to two weeks based on what, we, what happened in May. And so um, that's another reason that uh, it's, it's so important that we stay ahead of any problems that might come up. Of those problems, there's one in particular that farmers should be concerned about due to the weather. It may cause some growers to use creative ways in order to combat the issue. The top problem that we've got right now to concentrate on is diseases. Uh, hot, we're hot, we're, we're humid. Uh, white mold's already been seen in several fields. Uh, I expect leaf spots going to start showing up eventually. Um, those are the two biggest ones we got to deal with. And I think with the wet conditions, we've got some growers that can't get in the field on time. You know, you may want to start looking at uh, do I need airplanes to fly on my fungicides versus me trying with my, with my sprayer uh, just to kind of keep on track. Despite the early setback, Monford says growers shouldn't be discouraged as there is still a good harvest to be had. If we have a good wet, hot August and we have a good hot, wet September going into October and it doesn't cool down until November, hey, we got a chance to make a pretty, pretty good crop all the way through. Cotton also has been affected by the wet conditions as their planting season was pushed back as well. It's impacted it early on from the standpoint of we didn't have much rain and so it got very dry the early part of our planting window and then it became when it rained it poured, right? So we've had a lot of rain forced a lot of our cotton to be planted later than we'd like to um, and ultimately what that's done is put a larger portion of our crop planted at the end of our planting window if not really close to the end of it. But now that the crop is in the ground, it's important to keep a close eye on it as insect problems become bad this time of year. You know, to me, it's all about knowing what's going on, having a scout or hiring one or scouting yourself and doing it on a regular basis. You know, whether it's white flies or stink bugs or worms, 
you know, every field's different and ultimately being able to know what's going on in that field can help make that right decision or, or ultimately the wrong one. And just like peanuts, cotton growers will be hoping for favorable weather conditions considering just how small the margin for error is. Um, and what that ultimately is going to do is make the month of August really important for our growing season. We've had a fairly good one. It's a lot of rain so far. Uh, but the fact that you have a lot of late planted cotton, we don't have much room for air, so to speak. And we need, the, we need August to be a good month with good rainfall and good temperatures. Reporting from Moultrie, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Now don't forget, if you missed any part of Damon's story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety on our YouTube channel, that is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Plenty of stuff to choose from. In fact, the archives go all the way back to 2009. And while you're there, keep clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. Go ahead and send us some feedback. If you also have a story idea, leave us a comment or suggestion. Send us a message either on Facebook or at the address you see there on the screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Well, if you like horticulture and appreciate the artistic side of things, then the Atlanta Botanical Gardens Imaginary World Exhibit is right up your alley. How it all comes together and why it's the only one of its kind in the U.S. That's next when the Farm Monitor continues. Hello. Hi there. Thank you. Watch your step over the gap. I was mighty fortunate. I always wanted to shrimp, and I got to shrimp all my life, except the time Uncle Sam had me. And uh, my grandmother said the first word she ever heard me say was sea boat, and that was a shrimp boat, and I'm 75 years old now, and, and I'm still seeing shrimp boats. <laughs> when our guests come out on the Lady Jane, they're coming out on a shrimp boat so they can see how a shrimp boat works how the nets work. We teach them about the commercial shrimping industry so they know how it works here in the state. And then they get to see the nets come up and everything that we pull up in the nets, we dump out onto a big table. And it's a hands-on experience where we talk about all the different animals that come up in the nets. Uh, we pass them around, let the guests hold on to them and get up close with them. And it's not just shrimp. We pull up a wide variety of animals in the nets uh, from shrimp and crabs to sharks and stingrays, uh, lots of different kinds and different species of fish. So there's always new things pretty much every time we pull the net up of something to look at, something to hold on to, something to talk about. I think this is a great experience. Um, you often see the shrimp boats, you know, along the coast uh, driving by. And uh, it's, it's a great experience to be just a, a, a quote unquote civilian, uh, to be out with a captain and, and uh, catching shrimp and doing all the activities that, that he does on a daily basis to earn a living. So it's a pretty cool experience. It's a rarity for them. They see things that they'll probably never see again. And especially uh, when we dump the bag and uh, naturalist explains what everything is and how to hold it and lets them hold it and pass it around to other people and they really enjoy it. It's, uh, it's very educational. This would be my dream job. Uh, I've been on the Lady Jane working as a naturalist for a little over three years now. Being able to come out and be hands-on with all this marine life every day and being able to interact with the people and teach them about it that's the highlight of the job. Uh, marine life is a passion of mine, and just being able to share my passion with all the people when they come out is the best part of the job. One of the really neat things that uh, oftentimes happens in the summertime is our sharks and our rays are having babies, and occasionally, like we had today, we'll have a stingray, a mother stingray come up and have babies right there on the table. We have some big tubs of water that we let the animals swim around in while we are waiting to talk about them to keep them alive. And oftentimes those mama stingrays are swimming around in there and we'll have their babies right there in the tub. So people get to see a brand new newborn baby stingray or sometimes a newborn baby shark right there on their experience.
A kingdom of plant giants bloom throughout Atlanta's urban oasis. Swim with the mermaid, save the princess from the dragon, rise with the phoenix. Words taken directly from the Imaginary World's Visitor's Guide, now on display through October 28th at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. The exhibition, by the way, the only one of its kind in the United States. I got here in 2002, but in 2000, the group that makes these wonderful imaginative pieces, Mosaic Culture International, did their first major exhibition in Montreal. And they did it in 2000 for the millennium. So they wanted Montreal to be seen as the Green Garden City, and they did a spectacular exhibit. So I saw images of it. I didn't get to go there, but I saw it and I was like, oh, my dream would be if I could ever bring that to a botanical garden. So then I came here, and obviously we've done a lot of garden, or garden exhibits over the years, um, and this one just came to fruition because I did get to go to Montreal and meet the people who made these, and actually the director of the Montreal Botanical Garden put us all in touch and started talking about you know, why they didn't ever do anything like this in the United States. And for us, it is the art and science of horticulture, so it's both sculpture and which is the art side and it's the science of horticulture so it's just wonderful to showcase plants so we started design well over a year ago and then they fabricate the pieces in montreal made out of steel and then they ship them here and in march our horticulture team got busy in a greenhouse up near buford and started planting them so we have five full-time horticulturists plus one of our permanent horticulturists just dedicated to this exhibition. So now that it's installed, their job is pruning. So we have to water, a little bit of fertilizer, but the pruning is the most important part of it because the pruning is what creates those wonderful chevron lines on the phoenix and the detail on the camel man and on the peacock and um, on the dragon itself. So they're constantly pruning. We have a big lift that they go up and down in, and they're all experts in mosaic culture and the art of pruning these wonderful creatures, but it's a big job. So Alternanthera is one of the most important plants here because it can take the heat, it can take sun and shade, because think about the dragon. He is beautiful and big, but the wings, underneath his wings are planted, and that's shade top of his wing, sun. So you've got to have plants that are adaptable. So we have many varieties of Alternanthera, green ones, gray ones, red ones, some golden ones. So we use a lot of Alternanthera. This is an annual. So none of these, most of these plants don't survive the winter here, um, with the exception of the Carex. So if you go see woolly mammoth, he's covered in this wonderful sort of brownish, um, sandy colored, Carex. It looks like a woolly mammoth's hair. It's just wonderful cascading. I love it. I mean, it's really what I live for. The idea of integrating art and gardens and plants and people to me is what this garden is all about. And we've done it really well for decades. And this kind of an exhibition is so superb because it is about plants as well as about art and sculpture. And then you can hear all the people back there. What's the number one word they're using? Wow. So I love it because they're engaged in the garden and they're learning and they're having great pleasure and wonder. So I, that's the best way to leave. It's a pretty good job, isn't it? <laughs> Definitely a must-see. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. And here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening out on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming, plus with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week. <laughs>